Well, I want to welcome all of you. I'm so thankful that you're here today. I want to welcome those at Vincennes and those joining us at Princeton, anyone online, those in our fireside venue here at Washington. We're so thankful that you're joining in as we're in part two of this series called We Are the Church. It's really just a, a reacquaintance, kind of getting familiar again with the vision, the mission, and the purpose of Bethany. And last week, we looked at the vision statement. Today, we look at the mission statement. But let me just start with a simple question that might be really hard for some of you to answer. The question is, why are you here today? Maybe this is like the, the wrangling point, the place where you get together as a family before you go have breakfast or, or your lunch. Maybe this is the place where you just kind of meet up with friends that you don't see throughout the week. And since you don't have a lot of activity outside, this is, this is the central hub for you and your friends. Maybe this is the place where you accidentally got, you know, parked by the police officers at the street waving you in. I don't know why you're here today, but I know that this is the truth. We're all here for different reasons. And all of us have like this diversity to us about why we walked into a church building to, to worship, maybe to fellowship, maybe to grow in Christ, maybe to just get familiar with God or to, just to find some place of rest or security, but all of our reasons are different. And so knowing that there's difference in the room, knowing that we're all from different backgrounds and have different levels of education and different economic scales in the room, know, knowing all of that, what is the thing that levels us down and makes us all the same? Like if we're here for different reasons, what is it that draws us together and makes us one? Isn't it Jesus? Like if it's Jesus, just say Amen. Yeah, let's just uh, do a little role play with me. Uh, with me, it, 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 maybe, maybe you're from a different faith tradition, like uh, you might be, you know, Catholic, or you might have come from a denomination like, you know, uh, Presbyterian or Episcopalian or Methodist or Lutheran, whatever it is. Um, you might be a Baptist, and, and, and I don't know, you know, I know there's different, different sections of Baptist, and you maybe don't have a denomination at all. Maybe you never have stepped into a church until you stepped into Bethany. Would you just give me your background? Let's just shout it out when I count to three. Just shout out your background. Be proud of it like you once were proud of it, okay? So just shout out. Ready? Everybody, one, two, three, non-denominational. All right, that was a mess, right? That was like an absolute mess. Let's just say the name of Jesus together at the count of three. One, two, three. Jesus. Isn't that so much unifying? So much more unifying than all the, the craziness that we've walked in with. And I recognize that there's, there's, there's a background to us. I recognize that there's something behind us. But what's, what's us together right now? It's Jesus. And he levels the playing field for us, church. He brings us together and unites us and he connects us. And, and actually he puts us on a greater, a greater path of a mission, a greater vision for us. You know, the vision of Bethany is this, and, and we get this from Matthew 28. It's to exalt Jesus Christ so all will be saved. And that just goes right back to Matthew 28, the gospel, where uh, Jesus has these parting words for his disciples. And he says, go into all the nations and make disciples. Go in all the nations and make some disciples. And, and what Jesus commanded, we want to accomplish. We want to accomplish that. But if, if you just have a, a vision, but you don't have a strategy then I think really what you have is just a dream. And so you have to have a strategy when it comes to vision. If you wanna look at what we're talking about today and understand it better, a mission statement is really a strategy statement. It's like, how are we gonna get this done? How are we gonna reach the world with Jesus Christ so everybody will be saved? And so our mission statement is kind of, it's kind of uh, simple and memorable. Here's what it is. We get lost people saved and we get saved people pastored and we get pastored people trained and we get trained people mobilized to go and reach lost people. And there's this reciprocal nature to it that it's all starting over again. And as we, we begin to love on people and they come to Christ and they grow in Christ and are pastored in Christ, that they're mobilized too to go and reach more for Christ. And it really comes from this idea of Jesus saying, go and make disciples. Like there should be a reciprocalness to this. There should be a continualness to it so that it never ends, that it doesn't die off with a generation. And when Jesus talked about mission, when he talked about putting his church on a pathway to get something done. He often did it by story. He did it in story form. So you'd read a story of Jesus, oftentimes called a parable in the gospels. And you'd say, what's he getting at? And Jesus would say, well, here's what, I'm, here's what I'm after. And here's what you should be after too. One of those stories that I wanna look at real briefly is found in Luke chapter 14. And if you have a Bible that is uh, provided by the church, it's page 848 there, Luke 14. And there Jesus tells us the story, what's called the parable of the great banquet. It's about a man who hosts a giant party and he invites a bunch of distinguished guests, but they all have, they all at this distinguished party, they all have uh, excuses why they can't come to the party. And Jesus is actually telling this story. 
at a dinner party. And he's surrounded by people that really have a critical eye of him. He's surrounded by some Pharisees, some Sadducees, some religious leaders that don't really believe that he is the son of God. And Jesus sits at this dinner party before he tells a story about a dinner party. And, and he says, listen, some of you have been like trying to get to the head of the table and you've been trying to find a place of honor and it hasn't worked. And he talks about humility in Luke 14. And then he, he begins to talk about what it's gonna be like when we all are in heaven with God the Father. And that's what the story is really about. And there's one guy at the table who yells out and he says, hashtag blessed, I can't wait to have dinner with God. And Jesus kind of looks at that guy, an anonymous voice, and he tells the story as if to say, what makes you so sure that you're gonna be in heaven and having dinner with God? What gives you the security? Because you haven't accepted me, you haven't embraced me. What would give you the security in life to believe that you're gonna be absent from the body one day and present with God in heaven? And so here's the parable that Jesus tells us called the parable of the great banquet. Luke chapter 14, look at verse 16 with me. And we're just gonna read all the way through verse 24. And, and as we read, just so you know, uh, the, the man here, this, what's called the certain man that I'll read about is a symboling of God. It's, so when you see that, that's God in the story. And I want you to also check out, and you may not be, you know, literary majors, but I want you to check out some of the action verbs that are found in Luke 14. I'll kind of emphasize them for you. It starts out with saying, Jesus replied, here's the story, a certain man whom is symbolizing God was preparing a great banquet and inviting many guests. At that time of the banquet, he sent his servants, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike begin to make excuses. And the first one said, I've just bought a field and I've got to go and I got to see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try, try them out. Like I just bought the new car and I got to go test drive it. Please excuse me. Verse 20, still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Wonder what he's up to. Verse 21, the servant came back and reported this to his master. So the servant hears these excuses, realizes that the party uh, is not going to have any guests. And he comes back and says, listen, uh, a, a master, there's not going to be anybody coming to the party. And he came back and reported his master. And then the owner of the house became angry and he ordered, he ordered his servant, go out quickly, have a sense of urgency, get out of here and go into the streets and to the alleys of the towns and bring in whom? Who, bring in who? The poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. People who, are, who would never be distinguished guests anywhere. You just bring them all. In. Verse 22, sir, the servant said, what you order has been done, but there is still room. Like I already did that. I was faithful to what I knew you'd want to your mission. And I've already done that. So what do I do now? Verse 23, then the master told his servant, you go out then into the roads and the country lanes, go further out of town, go further than you have before and go into the country lanes and compel, compel them to come in so that my house will be full. And I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get to test, taste of my banquet. What a crazy story. Like the original guests that Jesus is talking about in that story who all had excuses were, were like, you ever heard this, the, the expression, these people are hard to reach? Like maybe you got like a dad in your life and, and he just never embraced faith. He just never has given a second thought of faith. He's always been busy in life, working hard in life, but he's never given Christ a second thought. And he's just now hard to reach. Like he's lived so long. He's lived so long without Jesus. His heart has grown hard. And now he's just so hard to reach with the gospel. And as much as you invite, and as much as you try to have him come into your life or explain him uh, the story of Jesus, it's just a hard heartedness. There's an invitation there, but he's just not receiving the invitation. It's hard to reach people. And Jesus is actually talking about the hard to reach people. And I, I think there's a couple points of application here. And the first one is that some people will just intentionally miss out on the invitation that Jesus has for them. People are just gonna like intentionally miss out when you go to them and you invite them into to faith and to embrace Jesus, they're just gonna have all sorts of reasons why they won't. Like they're gonna be busy. Uh, they're gonna be full of family affairs that seem so good on the outside, but they have no concern for faith affairs. They're gonna be uh, squandering their time and just paying no attention to the things of faith in their life. I want you to notice how the man who is symbolized as God, how he talks to his servant. He says, you need to go out and you need to go further than you've ever gone before. You catching this? Because in the story, while God is the master of the house, 
The servant is you and I. And he's telling you and I to go out further. Uh, maybe some of us have hard to reach people in our life. And God's saying, you need to invite them, but you need to continue on and you need to keep going further past where you ever have gone before in bringing other people into the faith as well. And I want you to catch on to some of these action verbs that, that, that Jesus talks about. Compel them, he says. Compel them to come in. That word compel means to, to beg them to come in. With great urgency, bring them in. And I think one of the applications you can pull from this is people will just miss out on the invitation that you provide for them and they'll do it intentionally. They'll just make excuses. But here's the second thing. God has entrusted you and I, he's entrusted our servants to go and bring people in. Like we have a mission to fulfill. And it doesn't matter if people embrace the invitation or reject the invitation. Our job is to go out and to do our best to invite people back to our wonderful, all-sufficient Savior. And what I found out about a congregation is this. A congregation, when it stops pressing out, it begins to dry up. And you know that. Some of you are from some congregations where the congregation has stopped pressing out and it started to dry up. And you're here now. You're here now because that congregation was only about themselves and it wasn't about others. It wasn't about those who were far removed from God. It was only about those who had embraced the invitation, but not those who had it, 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 it rejected or, or have not walked in just yet. And friends, God is expecting each and every one of us to go out of this gathering and go into this world with the mission to, to get lost people saved and saved people pastored and pastored people trained and trained people mobilized to go and reach more lost people. And you're not gonna change the church by attending church. You're gonna change, you're gonna change the world rather by, by being the church. You're gonna change the world by being the church, not just attending church. And friends, I'm here to tell you that people need the gospel message not just to, to help them, not just to advance their life, not just for healing, not just for hope. Uh, they need the church right now more than they've ever needed you before the world does. They need the church because the church, you all have the gospel message, which can rescue people from the deadness of their sins. You see, it's only Jesus who forgives our past wrongs. It's only Jesus who relieves our regret. It's only Jesus who frees us from our guilt. It's only Jesus who can reclaim our identity when we've lost our identity. It's only Jesus who can liberate us from what we once were. It's only Jesus who can elevate us to what we always thought we could be. It's only Jesus who can forgive us of our sins. It's only Jesus who can spare us from the penalty of our sins. It's only Jesus who can make a way to God and whom we've always craved to have a relationship with. It's only Jesus. And friends, you are the deliverer of that message, that invitation, that it's only Jesus. And the message of God's church is to reach the world with the good news of Jesus and to accomplish this. We're gonna need every single person to pull on the same rope in the same direction. So here's what I'm asking. I'm asking everybody who calls Bethany Christian Church home. Like if this is your home and that's how you regard this place to get on board with the vision, mission and purpose of Bethany. So this congregation can move the gospel message further, farther faster. Because when you own something, like I'm asking you to own this, when you own something, you treat it differently. You ever, you ever rented a car? When you drive that car and you've spilled something inside of the car, right? No big deal. It's a rental. Like who cares? It's, it's just a rental. But have you ever spilled something in your car? Like you spill something in your car, you grab for all the napkins that you've ever obtained from every drive through restaurant ever been to in the glove compartment and you try to mop it up. But if you can't find any napkins, you're reaching back for some old sock or clothing item that you have that maybe your kids have left behind to mop up the mess. But if it's a rental, you don't care. Like you don't, it doesn't matter to you. You don't own it, no big deal. Not my problem, not my, not my, not my problem to clean up. And you, you'll drive it through gravel, you'll get it dusty, not my car to wash up. Uh, it just doesn't matter. But that's not the way you treat your car. If there's a spill, you'd clean it up. If it gets dusty, you'd wash it up. You'd be careful on how you, you drive it. And sometimes, sometimes people treat the church like a rental. They just don't care. Like you hear about vision and you hear about mission and you hear about purpose. You say, that's good for leadership. That's good for the pastor, but that's not good for me. 
Like, I'll just do my thing my way as I want to do it. I don't need to embrace this. I don't need to get involved with it. Like, I don't need to push the mission forward faster. No concern of mine. I'm just kind of renting, renting the church right now, renting the ministries right now. And friends, that's, that's not what God has called us to do. He's called us to own the mission, not to rent it. He's called us to embrace it. It's the great commission, not the great suggestion. And I'm calling everyone who calls Bethany home to embrace the mission, the mission. It just doesn't hang on the wall. It's talked about in the hall and it's written on the heart. I want it to be written on your heart. Hey, this is a great picture of someone that has written the mission of Bethany Christian Church on their heart. This is Jay Yoakum. Jay was serving that day as a difference maker in our parking lot at our Vincennes campus. And Jay and his wife, Tammy, are always on the frontline ministries at the Vincennes campus. They do such a, a wonderful job of welcoming people in because they get it. He went the extra mile that day, not just to be a smiling face in the parking lot, but to make his own sign. And uh, even though his wife, I think, was a little embarrassed by it, he just ushered people in and waved them because here's what he understood. He understood that on a big day like Easter, that there are gonna be all sorts of folks who, who just hadn't been to church in a very long time. There's gonna be some people who had just never been to church ever who walk into the front doors. People are gonna be walking out of darkness of a situation, darkness of sin. And Jay wanted to be the first bit of light, just that first glimmer of hope to say, you're welcome here. You're loved here. You can be at ease here. There's no boundaries here. Just, just come as you are right now. And I'm, I'm loving on you. That, that, that encapsulates the heart of living out the mission in one point of Bethany Christian Church. And anybody that's a difference maker here at Bethany, you, you are awesome. And, and you may not be going about it the same way Jay does, but you're walking the extra mile and it's written on your heart. And that's what we're calling the people of this congregation to have, that mission of Jesus written on their heart. So how are you living out this mission? How are you living out getting lost people saved, saved people pastored, pastored people trained and trained people mobilized to reach lost people? Because the tendency is to not get involved. The tendency is to say, that's a good sermon, uh, but that's for you, Matt. That was, that's, a, that's a great idea. It's a catchy logo and, and motto and it's clever, but that's for the leadership, not for us. That's for the pastoral team and uh, it's not for the congregation. So, so how, how are you living this out? Because I know the tendency, the tendency is like, not, not gonna do it. That's, that's, I'm gonna rent this thing, not own this thing. How, how are you living this out? And so what I've done, I've come up with a pop quiz. Don't you love pop quips? Oh, there's supposed to be like a big moan, audible moan in the room. Because when I was in school, I would have audibly moaned. I would have been that kid who went like, oh, and I would have grumped out a little bit because what I hated was anytime the teacher was like, I'm going to see what you really know. I'm going to expose you right now. But here's the best part about my pop quiz. You get to grade your own test and we're not even writing it down. It's like a mental thing that you can work through. So here's the four questions I am proposing to you that are very individualized, very personal, about how you're living out the, the mission that God has called us to through Bethany Christian Church. Question number one, if our mission is to get lost people saved, whose eternity has forever changed because you told them about Jesus? If our mission is to get lost people saved, whose, whose eternity has forever changed because you've told them about Jesus? Not me, not your spouse or your kids, but you've told them about Jesus. And I'm not talking about like a methodology to learn. I'm not, I'm talking about a message that you're, you're carrying and you're telling. And I'm not even telling that you're, you're, you're telling people, wow, you got to change your life. You, you're misbehaving. You, you know, th this is wrong. Or I'm not telling them what are the five steps to get to Jesus? Like what you have to do to receive Jesus. No, no, no. I'm talking about how have you just told somebody about Jesus? How have you changed their forever? Because you spoke Jesus to them. You know, the, the word gospel is that Greek word eugelion. We, we taught this just a, a few months ago. And that, that word eugelion is two English words which crash together from their Greek origins. That first word is eulogy, which means we're speaking something good about something, someone. And that second word is the word angel, which is a good messenger. And so we, we just said that the gospel is this, it's a good message from a good messenger. And my question to you all is, how have you been a good messenger with a good message? That's really the question. Like those who follow Jesus are called to share the gospel, the good message, and to be a good messenger. And so what's the good message? Well, simply it's Jesus. Jesus has paid the penalty for our sins. Jesus has rescued us from our sins. And now anybody can have a relationship with God. And I think spreading the word about what God has done for you is just that simple. It's just, here's what God's done in me. Because some of you are trying to convince others that there's a God. Some of you are trying to convince others that Jesus is the King of Kings. Some of you are trying to convince 
and you're trying to like lecture and you're trying to argue and all you have to do is tell your story of what God has done right here in you. Because you know what? It's hard to argue with a changed life. Look at Matthew or Mark chapter five. And if you want to turn there, it's great. It's going to be on the screen. Uh, Jesus has uh, just delivered a man from demon possession. And as he's delivered that man, he is fully released from those demons. He is recognizing the liberty and the freedom he has now in Christ. But because he had been demon possessed, he'd been ostracized by his community. He'd been set apart to live in the cemetery of the town on the fringe of society. His family and his friends have all abandoned him because he is just ravaged by demons. He wasn't himself. And when those demons are released, he gets his identity back. He's free to be himself and He's forgiven of his sins and he wants to stay with Jesus because Jesus liberated him. He wants to walk with Jesus, get back in the boat with Jesus and travel with the 12 disciples with Jesus. And here's what Jesus tells him. It's on the screen. No, go home to your family. And you know, he's probably thinking, my family doesn't like me. He's saying, no, you go home to your family and you tell them everything that the Lord has done for you and how merciful he's been. What's he to do? He's gonna tell them what God has done right here in him. Not what God can do for them, but what God has done in him. So verse 20 says, so the man started off and he visited the 10 towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for what? For for him, not for them, for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. And if you just wanna go by what Jesus tells that man, he's telling us, you need to go out in this world and you need to tell everyone what Jesus has done in you. Not what he can do for them, but what he's done for you. How has he liberated you? You share your story about how Christ has changed your life. And maybe, maybe though, you've forgotten your story. And I would bet to say that the majority of us in this room who've been Christians for a very long time, we're like sunsetting now, we have forgotten our story. And I, I hope that as Rooted comes back at all of our campuses, which is uh, learning the seven rhythms that we think are core and essential for staying spiritually strong in the faith, you'll learn your story Because anybody who's been to our rooted experience, you have learned your story. You've learned that it's not hard to tell. You learned that it's your story and not someone else's. And it's just about explaining what God has done in you and through you. And friends, if you can start explaining that story, you can start sharing the gospel message. It's not very difficult. And what we need to remember is that as we share, it's not us who saves. It's not our story who saves. Who saves? God saves. Jesus saves. And I love how the Apostle Paul looked at this and how he shared the gospel. Uh, He said, listen, I was really brilliant and I was really smart and I had all the diplomas on the wall, but I made the gospel message super simple because I understand that people need it in simple form. And Paul said, so I didn't. I didn't educate. I didn't lecture. I didn't try to come up with five clever points or a clever motto. I just told him my story. So in 1 Corinthians chapter two, he says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. Did you know what he says? My message. And my, my preaching, I had to preach from what I knew and I had to preach from my place of where I was, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power. I didn't rely on myself, Paul says, I relied on God as I told my story so that your faith may not rest on human wisdom, but on the power of God. And I've shared with, this, with you before that what you need to tell people at the core about your story. You need to tell them about God's plan. God's plan that he doesn't want anyone to perish, but have eternal life that you recognize that, you found that, that you didn't want to perish and you recognize that God had a plan for your life. You need to tell them about your problem or our problem, that you had a problem and the problem was sin and sin has fractured the relationship that God wants to have with us. You need to tell them about God's provision, that Jesus was sent to provide a way and escape from that fracturedness to make it back whole and be reunited back to God. You need to tell them about God's promise that anyone who believes in Jesus will be, will be saved from their sin. And friends, maybe for you today, you just look at that and you say, okay, I'm gonna start learning my story and I'm gonna start sharing my story to start living out the mission of Jesus Christ. Here's the second question of this pop quiz. If a part of our mission is to get saved people pastored, who's a better follower of Jesus because you're in their life? Who's a better follower of Jesus because you're just walking beside them? You know, it's a weekly question, I think, As a pastor, I have to ask, am I equipping people? Am I pastoring people? Are people better followers because I'm in their life? I one time had summed up my role here that I'm a a leader and a feeder. I lead and feed. And if that's my role as a pastor, your role as a Christian is to be a minister, to walk alongside people, to pastor them as well, to be a part of their pains and their joys in life, to invite as many people as we can like that servant was 
doing in Luke 14. And I think as a Christian, we're all called to minister alongside someone else. This past week, you, you probably remember the story that was a part of our dollar difference where Stuart and Marissa Davis had been caring for uh, Cindy Harrison, uh, Marissa's mother. And uh, you watched that story being told to us from Evan Nave last week. Uh, this, this last week, I was on our, our Facebook group page for our Washington campus. And I noticed that uh, Kendra Dugas had, had set up a meal train for Marissa and Stuart and Cindy. And it just kind of, I just thought about that. And I thought, well, why, why hadn't we done that? And I didn't know what she put in there, like, hey, she's a friend of mine and I wanted to walk the extra mile. And, and as I said, hey, Kendra, can I tell the story? She was just kind of like, well, why? What's the big deal? And I thought, because that's like, that's the heart of what we want to do here. That's why I want to tell that story. Because that's, that's something that we all should be doing here. Like we see the need, we recognize the need, let's meet the need. We see the hurt, let's go and let's heal the hurt. Like let's, let's do our role of pastoring people the best we can. Like that's not just the role of those who are on staff, that's the role of all of us here. I think it's like this simple motto that Jesus has for us to kind of put this into our own lives where he says, treat others just as, as you wanna be treated. Like isn't it like the basic basic tenets of what it means to pastor other people. How, how would I want someone to come alongside of me right now? Like if I was taking care of someone that was sick and, and ailing, how would, how would I want someone to care for me? I think every follower is called to be a minister. And you know, may not know what that looks like, but it just simply is get involved in people's pain. It's getting people, it get involved in people's celebration. And you're, you might be saying, I, I don't even know where to go with that. Did you know every believer has been empowered by the Holy Spirit with at least one giftedness to build up the church? And maybe you just need to say, God, I, I don't know what to do here, but could you use me? Use my gifts in some way. Maybe you just start praying that prayer. How can I pastor this person that's on my heart right now? God's empowered you to do that. God's empowered all of us to pastor others. Here's the third pop quiz question. If part of our mission is to get pastored people trained, what areas of your faith have grown in the past few months? What areas of your faith have grown in the past few months? Like, and you might be thinking, well, I, I don't know. If you don't know, that could be a real problem. That could be that you're maybe paused on puberty rather than becoming a mountain of maturity. And let me just give you some ways that you can evaluate your spiritual growth for a minute. Number, number one question is this. Are things of faith becoming a greater priority to you today than they were yesterday? Are things of faith becoming a greater priority to you today than they were yesterday? Like, is Bible reading becoming a greater priority? Is, is giving becoming a greater priority in your life? Is serving becoming a greater priority in your life? Here's another question that you can kind of evaluate this. Are you moving from isolation to community? Meaning, are, are you sitting here saying, listen, I can't do the row thing anymore. I gotta get in a circle here with these people. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta get connected with somebody somehow beyond just this hour and five minutes that we spend together in worship on Sunday morning. Here's the third question. Have your wants and desires changed for God instead of for yourself? Like, are you now thinking of ways in which you can build up God's kingdom rather than your own kingdom? Are you willing to say, listen, I'm gonna put in the grind and I know it's gritty, but I want God's kingdom to come first in my life. His will be done beyond mine. And if you're thinking in, in terms of maturity and, and just, though age, just so you know, age doesn't guarantee spiritual maturity. Where are you at? Kind of just pinpoint yourself on kind of a progression line of faith. Where are you at? Are, are you an infant in the faith right now? Are you just like uh, in a place where you're just, uh, you're just starting? Are you a teenager in the faith? Maybe you're in adulthood. Where would you classify yourself right now? And are you maturing down that line? Because if your desire is to spiritually grow, uh, the one thing that matures people fastest is uh, reading scripture and teaching scripture. Because if you're sitting here saying, listen, I'm, I'm not progressing, I'm not growing. Let me give you two avenues you can do that the fastest. This is like the um, maturity pill. Read some scripture, wrestle with that scripture, teach that scripture. And we have this uh, leadership development group that I meet with about every six weeks or so. And it's guys in the room that have expressed a desire uh, to be elders. And... Uh, that's where it starts. It starts with that desire to be an elder. And so we've taken them in, under our wing and tried to mentor them the best we could. Last, uh, last Saturday, we were talking about uh, practical theology. Sounds fun, doesn't it? Yeah. Eight o'clock in the morning, practical theology. Uh, hey, we had drinks and breakfast, but you know, practical theology, it's just not that fun of stuff. And, and we were like wrestling with it. And I remember getting my elders together, our elders together. And I asked them like, how did you guys become 
understanding of theology. Like they didn't go to seminary. They, how, did you guys, how do you guys know doctrine? How do you know this stuff? Here's the answer they gave me. We, we teach it. And there's that quality that, that you find that of an elder where it says must be able to teach, must be able to teach. And I think there's so much value and importance even though that's, that's undersold to that. Because here's what happens when you teach. Every time I preach, every time I teach, here's what happens. You get into God's word, so you have to study it. But more so you have to wrestle with it. And you have to let it just kind of sit here. And like Isaiah says, I ate the scroll and it was bitter and, and it was sweet. It was sweet and sour. I got to wrestle with some things. I got to work on me and, and I got to really digest it so that it's understandable for people to, to make applicable. And I've and I got I to know who Jesus is and not just know a lot about who Jesus is. I need to really know him and embrace him right here. I've got to, I got to not just know this book. I need to know the author of this book. And what happens is when you do that, you start to teach yourself, you start to wrestle with the word and, and it starts to work it out with fear and trembling and it creates maturity within you. And so let me, let me just say this to anybody, blanket statement, same thing I'd say to our leadership development group. If you want to mature in your faith, start teaching someone about faith. It could be in our children's ministry. It could be in an adult Sunday school and you get mentored by one of our teachers. It could be a small group setting. I don't know what it is, but you just need to say, hey, I, I, I want, sign me up for that. It's not about how much you know, guys. It's about just saying, I've got a desire to step out and to learn and to be mentored and to grow in my faith. Okay, here's the, here's the fourth question. I wanna just move to the fourth question. If a part of our mission is to get trained people mobilized to reach lost people, what's your strategy to lead one more person to Jesus? What's your strategy? Do you just hope it will happen? You know, we talked about hard to reach people earlier where Jesus says there was that invitation that was given to some, but they all had excuses. I, I've, got that, I've got this family in my life like that. For a couple of years now, I've been trying to get this family whom I absolutely love to attend Bethany Christian Church with me. And you'd think that an invitation from the senior pastor of a large church in a small town, they'd be like, yeah, absolutely, let's go. It just hasn't been that way. And I, and I can't shake, I can't shake them from my heart. I pray for them every single day. And it doesn't matter if it's a special Sunday. It doesn't matter if I say, hey, I've got this sermon series that I think would be awesome for you guys to listen to and be a part of. It doesn't matter if I say, hey, I want you part of our small group. They always have some kind of reason why they can't join me or why they can't come. And it breaks my heart. And it kind of just reminds me of the, the ones that are like, listen, I've got a field that I've bought. I've, I've got a, a new marriage I've got to you know, be a part of and really commit to. And it just reminds me of all the excuses that you find in Luke 14. And here's, here's my struggle, is that they're good, good people. I mean, they are good, good people. And you know what? They know they're good, good people. And I think that's what's holding them back from being godly, godly people. It's because sometimes good is the enemy of godly, isn't it? And I think the strategy that I've had has been real simple. I'm gonna pray for you right now. And I have to have a strategy with them because they are hard people to get into the building. They're hard people to talk to about Jesus Christ, but they're good people. And I'm saying this because some of you are gonna be meeting with some of those kinds of people Thursday. You're gonna be meeting around a meal and you're gonna be around some family members. There's some hard people. And you've been trying for a long time to get some of these hard people to come and embrace who Jesus Christ is. And it's just not gonna come out naturally uh, more than likely, it's going to come out in argumentative form if you try to share your faith uh, and tell them what they need to do. But maybe you can find some strategy, some way that you can just share your story with you, about Jesus to them. Because there's an importance about Thursday. You're going to meet up with some people whom you love, whom you embrace, and that is the prime time to share who Jesus Christ is in your life and what he's done for you. And you're saying, well, I don't know how to do that, preacher. Let me give you some ideas real quick on the screen. Be prayerful. Pray for these people today. Start today about what's coming Thursday. You know who's gonna be at the dinner table. Be prayerful, be conversational, all right? This is not about making statements. This is about listening, asking questions. Third, be authentic. Just be yourself. Don't try to be holier than now. Don't try to pretend that you have your act all together. If they point out some kind of sin in your life, you need to say, yep, and, I, and I'm being saved by grace. Be patient, okay? You're not gonna win them over by the end of dinner time. It's not going to happen. You know, you're going to win them over by the time the, the Cowboys play. And be simple. Like keep it as simple as possible. Keep your story simple. And I just need to remind you of the urgency of all this stuff. Everybody spends forever somewhere. 
Like, would you keep that in mind? Everybody spends forever somewhere. And let me just say to any of you that are kind of wrestling right now with, with some spiritual things, where are you gonna spend eternity today? Where do you spend eternity today? Because Jesus proclaimed these words in John 14, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It better start right there with Jesus. Your answer better be Jesus. He's not just the unifier, friend. He's the Savior and he's the Lord. And so if, if your answer about, well, where will I spend forever? Uh, it's in heaven. And if I ask you why, it's because I've done good things. Wrong answer. Because Jesus has done everything. Because Jesus has released my guilt, my sin, my penalty from, from that sin. And he has set me up in a personal relationship with God the Father. Friends, I want you to know who Jesus is, to walk with Jesus, to live for Jesus, to embrace Jesus, to die with Jesus so that you can live forever with Jesus. Will you pray with me? God, as we conclude today, um, set some people on our heart that need us to tell our story. And may we be conscious of how we do it gently, truth, grace. May we be on this mission to get lost people saved and pastored and trained and mobilized. We need you to help us. May we really embrace this and own it. We pray these things in Christ Jesus' name, amen.